All right. Good morning, everybody. This is Topics in American Literature, Fall 2021 semester, and we've made it through Halloween. It is uh, All Saints Day. It is November 1st, 2021. And uh, I'm Mr. Smith, Andrew William Smith, uh, teacher on the radio, DJ, music fan, literature teacher. And I'm, I fuse pop culture and literature in this class. And today's talk is on music festivals as utopias and dystopias, which we are studying uh, currently uh, the fusion of utopia and dystopia in two uh, contemporary American novels, the uh, late uh, 20th century novel by uh, Octavia Butler called Parable of the Sower and the brand new uh, 21st century novel uh, by Sarah Pinsker uh, called Song for a New Day. Both of these uh, books uh, fuse uh, utopia and dystopian elements and they're both future fictions. The Sarah Pinsker book specifically deals with rock and roll and uh, the cancellation of concerts uh, during a global um, crisis. In her novel, it involves terrorism and a pandemic. In our world, though, global uh, concerts were canceled uh, due uh, to a pandemic. Is a postmodern musical festival a utopian space, a paradise? scene uh, or is it the opposite uh, as one article claimed the essence of a self-imposed dystopia uh, in the article music festivals are the corporate dystopia that we deserve delilah friedler skewers any idea that we can return to the garden on the wisp of a joni mitchell lyric of course joni mitchell wrote the song woodstock about getting back to the garden that we can get back to the collective romantic memory of primary festivals, whether that would be an ancient Saturnalia right up to Woodstock. After attending uh, Coachella, Fr Friedler wrote this screaming indictment about festivals in general. In the context of a land scarred by colonization, in a time when climate catastrophe looms, mainstream festivals reinforce the systems that have brought the earth to her knees. Raving beneath American flags, ex blondes explode on screen. Kids are finding ecstasy in symbolic displays of unconscionable violence. It certainly isn't sustainable, and the come down must be brutal. Now, this is very harsh, and I'm a, I'm a regular attendee of music festivals, and I also share some of the values of that author. And so in my essay, I tried to re retort that. Um, um, and I start, I start uh, with, uh, uh, with Bonnaroo and the, uh, uh, and the Bonnaroo uh, Manifesto. Um, and then I go, um, I go back uh, in time uh, through different uh, festivals, and uh, and then I take us all the way back uh, uh, to 1969, um, and and some of the uh, key festivals in American history. But we're going to go back, and uh, revivals uh, like um, church tent revivals and cultural festivals were all ready happening in the 19th century. So this is uh, more than 100 you know, 30 years ago, 140 years ago, in the mid 19th century, uh, there was kind of traveling uh, uh, festivals. And one of these was what was called uh, the Chautauqua Movement. And that ended up being um, kind of located at a, a fairly quaint uh, religious and uh, arts and literary festival uh, that takes place in a place called Chautauqua, New York. And, and that's the remaining Chautauqua. And you can go there every summer and they have a, a full season. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like Coachella for your great grandparents, and uh, I've been with my parents, who are would be like your great grandparents' age, uh, several years ago, and it was a fantastic experience. And you stay in these uh, uh, cute little houses, and there's no cars allowed, and everybody walks everywhere, and there's these beautiful, uh, you know, uh, pedestrian areas that you can eat in your home where you're staying, or there are uh, vendors where you can, uh, you know, buy food, and you have lectures. Um, they have religious uh, services. Um, and they have concerts at night, and it's a really uh, incredible thing. And so the idea of, uh, and then of course, you know, in the uh, American uh, frontier, uh, you had various uh, evangelists, and then you also had uh, cultural pioneers, because all over the 19th and early 20th century, you had social reformers, you had, you know, in the 19th century, we had women's, uh, women's rights, we had abolitionists, of course, you had the temperance movement, which was the, uh, led towards the uh, temporary uh, um, prohibition of alcohol and things of this nature. So you had kind of the the, the traveling soapbox rock on tour. You had somebody who would travel from town to town and, and put up a tent and they would enter. You had traveling circus performers. Uh, you had musicians uh, for sure. Uh, you had the old 
uh, go to, down to the Delta, you had the old juke joints. Uh, you go up to the big cities in the Midwest, you had uh, clubs and theaters where, you know, you had traveling musicians going all over the world uh, and all over the United States, uh, dating back qu quite a few generations. And so, so the music festival scene that emerges in the United States in uh, the 19, uh, in the late 1960s and, and goes on to this day is it, it emerges from uh, something. Um, and even even in terms of uh, uh, last summer, uh, uh, this idea of, of a dystopia versus a utopia could even be seen in terms of logistics. We've had uh, we've had count, countless deaths at these festivals. We've had um, problems with water, food, sanitation, and things of this nature. But but because they make money, is money alone enough to justify this? Who who knows? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the uh, um, I think there is a um, emotional, psychological. I have a theory anyway. I, 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 why do we keep going back? We have an emotional, psychological, and spiritual need to get together with strangers and dance, dance till the sweat flows through our pants. Like nobody's wa dance like nobody's watching when you know you got a hundred thousand other people uh, watching with you. So uh, you're going to get a crash course in the history of the American Music Festival today and uh, and some uh, very kind of sober, very kind of <laughs> not happy observations about one particular festival uh, festival or two in America that have that have gone severely wrong. Um, the idyllic idea of a of a um, American Music Festival starts at Monterey Pop and Monterey Pop happens in the Bay Area. Uh, of California or near the Bay Area of California um, in the in the late 60s. Uh, I think Monterey Pop was a uh, spring of 67. I'm apologize. I'm freestyling a lot of this, but this is a, a lot of knowledge that I have deep, deep inside of my heart and mind from years and years of study. But Monterey Pop was very successful. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel, Mamas and the Papas, uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Otis Redding. I think these are some of the artists that were there. But notice uh, this um, this crowd shot. Uh, from Monterey Pop. Look how well behaved everybody is. Everybody's sitting. You ever been to a show at a theater? Maybe you've been to a show at the Ryman or, you know, there's been some shows that I've been to where the ushers walk around and tell you to sit down. And uh, I mean, I, I don't want to be rude to the people behind me if their legs are tired and they can't, you know, they're, they're they've got super glue to their glutenate, you know, to their glutes, you know, but like I get up. Uh, at a rock show and, and occasionally they'll tell you to sit down. But um, here we are, you know, uh, in the height of the hippie period in uh, California and they're, and they're sitting down. I think that's, that, that's very, uh, that's extremely interesting uh, uh, to me to see that. Um, the famous, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on this uh, this morning because I have some other points to make, but the famous icon of American music festivals is uh, the Three Days of Peace and Music in uh, White Lake, New York, in uh, uh, on Yasger's Farm. It's actually not in the town of Woodstock. It's actually quite almost two hours from Woodstock. And this summer, for the first time in my life, I made the pilgrimage. I had left somewhere in um, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, somewhere uh, southern Pennsylvania, or was it northern Virginia? I, I don't remember. I was. I was bleary eyed and weary because I had actually just attended a music festival in Virginia and I made a long drive. Uh, we got there just before the museum closed. I got to Yasgur's farm. I toured the site. I got to tour the Catskills, which was incredible. And I got to go to the town of Woodstock uh, this summer on a, on a pilgrimage. I should have added uh, some photos uh, of my trip this summer. Maybe if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll dig those up and, and show them to you. But it was just, it was an outrageous and wonderful experience for me, uh, a, a true pilgrimage. But what happened is Woodstock was a hot mess and they've, they've amplified it into mythology. Um, they had almost a half a million people and they did not have um, enough food or sanitation and they didn't have enough uh, security or an ability to take tickets. And so, um, and all the freeways, they didn't have enough parking, all the freeways around the festival were shut down. And these aren't, aren't uh, interstates like I-40, these are, like Highway 70 type freeways, you know, so all of these very unequipped uh, back roads of upstate New York, upstate from the city, uh, New York. Uh, and this is just a couple hours out of New York City, but this is a very rural area. It reminded me of Sparta and uh, Smithville when I was driving through the Catskills. I couldn't believe how beautiful it was and how actually rugged and rural it was. And it was at once a time of 
I, it was called the Borscht Belt. It was a big uh, Jewish vacation area from New York. Uh, Jewish community would go up there. But most of the the, the big uh, vacation palaces are now decrepit ruins. And so if you're like me, you love great American ruins. Uh, the Catskills are an, an amazing place. I didn't realize how badly I wanted to tell you about my summer vacation. I, I'll, I'll loop back around to this. But uh, um, you know, uh, it was three days. Uh, Jimi Hendrix closed it with the national anthem that he he absolutely annihilated on the electric guitar. Um, you had great folk icons like Joan Baez's had a she had a very important set there. Uh, the Grateful Dead, The Who, uh, you know, Ravi Shankar, um, uh, Richie Havens, of course, opened it up. Joe Cocker's version of uh, Help from Our Friends, very famous from this. Um, but but, but basically, uh, there was a big rainstorm. Uh, there were people sleeping in the mud, uh, people bathing in a lake. There weren't it just it was it was kind of a hot mess, but it somehow has been elevated to this idea of of a temporary utopia uh, that can be created out of nothing, out of thin air. And the site now has been pristinely uh, uh, restored. Uh, and you can go and sit in that beautiful field without 300,000, 500,000 people. And uh, uh, the emotions that overcame me sitting in the in the Woodstock field this summer, I'm, I want to go back. Uh, I did not get to take my sweetheart this summer. I'd like to go back and take her as early as uh, next summer. And I got to visit some other poet types, uh, hippie poet types like myself. Up in the town of Woodstock, it was just an exhilarating uh, experience all around, um, and the ruins and the Catskills, mind, mind boggling. Uh, but I don't know that this was a utopia, but it's been elevated the myth. Oh, and one of the main reasons why is that they made a very, very excellent film about it, and the film uh, reached people in, you know, it probably showed in Cookville. I mean, it was a major market documentary film. Uh, and you can you can go and get it now. I don't think you can get it for free, but you could pay a couple dollars on your streaming services. And now they have a, you know, uh, an unedited or a less edited, direct, more comprehensive director's cut that would take you a day. It'd be a commitment. You know, you might want to watch it in, in shifts. It's almost like a series. I think it's about three hours or so. The uh, it's at least it's it's around three hours the whole experience anyway uh, to watch the film. But that that made it to the hinterlands. And it, and, it, and it accelerated and elevated this mythology of the of the rock festival. And then so it had uh, a spinoff in California, which I'm going to come back to, which was the Altamont Festival in uh, uh, the Altamont Speedway uh, in Northern California in December of uh, 69, the same year. And and in the in the rock mythology of America, Altamont and Woodstock are, are, are bookends of something that is at tension. You know, this is the bad side. And, and sometimes you might accuse me of uh, romanticizing uh, the hippie movement of sort of, you know, having uh, rose colored glasses on. I mean, I am wearing a tie dye t-shirt today of a, uh, of a, uh, a grateful dead cover band out of Nashville called the stolen faces that have played at tech in the, in the backdoor playhouse. Uh, by the way, this week in the backdoor playhouse is opening the fantastics on Thursday, go there for extra credit. Uh, so, uh, so, but but the mythology and the and the and the cookie cutter shorthand version of this is that that Woodstock was the end of the '60s, you know, utopia, and Altamont uh, was dystopia. But maybe like these novels, uh, music festivals have elements of of utopia and dystopia. But I'm going to come back to uh, um, uh, my critique of Altamont in uh, just a moment. Uh, there's many many spinoffs. Uh, the closest one to home uh, was the Atlanta Pop uh, Festival. Uh, you'd have the Allman Brothers Band. Uh, you definitely had uh, 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 Jimi Hendrix was there before he passed. One of the gr last big gigs that Hendrix did before he died. Hendrix, of course, died terribly, tragically young at uh, 27 years old, like uh, Jan Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison. All those tragic uh, deaths of the rock uh, subculture that we had in the early uh, 70s. I do know somebody who was at Atlanta Pop, so I know it really, really happened. And he basically, he doesn't remember it. I mean, it, it's, you know, uh, you know, that old saying, if you were, if you were in the sixties, you didn't remember it. I mean, cause people were intoxicated and sometimes their memories are sketch of that. So that's why I go to concerts sober today, completely stone cold sober, just a little bit of coffee, maybe a little bit of, a little bit of Red Bull and I'm, I'm good to go. So the Atlanta pop festival, um, it was a part of a whole movement of uh, festivals that happened all over the United States. And many of them were, were utter failures. They had one down in Louisiana uh, that was a disaster. So there was there was not just the Altamont disaster, there was many uh, disastrous uh, festivals that happened. Um, the largest one, larger than uh, Woodstock, was uh, the Watkins Glen Summer Jam in upstate New York. 
That was three groups, the Allman Brothers Band, uh, the Grateful Dead, and uh, and the band in 1973. And I've seen the footage of this. Now, there was no overwhelming, you know, tragedies or fights or what you could see, um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't glamping, okay? Uh, if you go to a festival today, you can spend lots of money to glamp. Uh, glamping is the, the fusion of the term glamour and camping, and these people are, you know, in RVs. They're in these, like, these little yurts and, and you know, bourgeois teepees and stuff. No, go go Google up some Watts, Watkins Glen footage. I mean, and these are just people like sleeping on the ground, sleeping in the dirt. It's very primitive uh, what these other, uh, these early festivals were, but they did uh, manage. And I, I don't know this one, I think they might have actually uh, uh, taken your $10. But for $10, it was a Bonnaroo ticket today several hundred dollars but in 73 for 10 bucks you could go for the weekend uh to the largest music gathering ever the Watkins Glen Summer Jam and see the Almond Brothers Band the Grateful Dead and uh the band um uh there's a great documentary on Amazon Prime you can watch about this called the Festival Express there's also a DVD I don't know you probably stream it also they did they redid this uh, a few years ago, around uh, 2011, 2010, uh, was it 2010, 2011, 2012, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, with uh, Mumford and Sons, uh, Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros and the Old Crow Medicine Show did a train trip across America uh, where they they stopped in different towns um, and did uh, concerts. This one took place in Canada where they lived on the train and they went across Canada. The problem that they had, though, at that time was after Woodstock, the kids decided that every uh, music festival should be free, that it was, you know, they decided it was immoral to charge money uh, for a concert. It's kind of like us and our Spotify, you know. Um, but the thing that there's a tension here because we still live in a capitalist society and the labor, people should be paid for their labor, right? So the artist, you know, I love this class, but I, this class costs you guys money to take this class. So the artists need to get paid. And, and in there, um, you see uh, Bob Weir in particular of the Grateful Dead being interviewed and being sounding like kind of like, you know, what the kids back then would have called a capitalist pig. You know, like he needed to get paid. He did not want uh, to provide what his labor, his service uh, to the community for free. And they had to negotiate with the Canadian uh, authorities all across this tour Um because these kids were, were going to try to shut down these concerts because they cost uh, because they cost money. But it's a great documentary, and it and it, it would if you want to get a snapshot of these things, you can watch the Woodstock movie, you can watch the Altamont movie, and you can watch uh, the Festival Express movie. Um, all fantastic movies, all available on widely on your streaming services. Uh, if anybody wants to go and watch these, make this topic of your last paper. Go for it. So the Woodstock film, the Altamont film, and the uh, Festival Express film. Now you will have to pay. I believe I don't think you can get these anywhere for free. But you know, some people know how to. Some people know how to do all that. So um, this partially has to do with an ego uh, control issue with the Rolling Stones. Um, and by the way, the Rolling Stones cannot be in your mixtape for your final because they are not American artists. And you have this idea, kind of of. Of, of, uh, of a replay of the American Revolution, you know, the British and the Americans, you know, at war, because basically the Rolling Stones, in a sense, in this story represent kind of the, uh, the colonizer. They're coming back, you know, and uh, they're kind of, you know, these, these uh, British pirates sort of kind of ransacking America, but they go to Muscle Shoals. I've, I've time to time I had students on this class who are from Alabama. So they go to Muscle Shoals, they record, uh, some songs uh, in Muscle Shoals. They tour the United States, and uh, and their tickets. I think their tickets were like ten dollars or whatever. Maybe like, oh my god, it's so expensive. The Rolling Stones are so greedy, and so they say that they're going to give this free concert at the end of their tour. Uh, they're going to partner with the Grateful Dead. They're going to have the West Coast Woodstock. I mean, and if and if the New York Woodstock was good, uh, the San Francisco Woodstock is going to be better. Um, wrong 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 uh, they also had uh, the jefferson airplane uh flying burrito brothers uh i had a vertically version of this where i played some clips you have to go out and look those up yourself but the flying burrito brothers were the um part of the curators of alternative country and southern rock before we had it of course allman brothers band and leonard skinner get you know credited with creating southern rock 
Uh, but go back and listen to the Flying uh, Burrito Brothers and the music of Graham Parsons, and you see this country influence. And you listen to the records uh, like Let It Bleed that the Stones and Sticky Fingers that the Stones are putting out around this time. And the Stones are so influenced by American blues and American country music. It's just, it's outrageous. And it's, and it's quite special to see what, what Mick and Keith do with the American influence that they're getting from people uh, like traditional black blues artists like Etta James and uh, people like that, but also from uh, 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 alternative countries from the Flying Burrito Brothers. Uh, but but Altamont, I mean, the only thing we're going to see really in common here is uh, this, I, you know, that, that everybody has to park and walk a long way. And, and the attendance is outrageously huge, uh, uh, just like, uh, just like uh, uh, Woodstock. So, um, uh, so today a boutique festival is much more, much more corporate. Uh, it's just like going to the Super Bowl or the World Series. Uh, you know, go Atlanta if you're in the, you know, watching the World Series. You're cheering for Atlanta, or you're cheering for what is it, Houston, or is it over yet? Does I, I'm not following baseball like I should. Did somebody win? Uh, did Atlanta? Is it over yet? What's the score in the World? The World Series, but it's like Wimbledon. It's like going to the Kentucky Derby. It's like going to the Super Bowl. It's, it's a boutique for the people who can ha who have money. You poor kids can't go uh, to the festivals today. They're 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 just uh, too expensive. Tickets range from very expensive uh, to VIP extravagant. Um, um, you can volunteer uh, if you're young and you need a job. You can find it if they if they Bonnaroo again got canceled this year. Two years in a row, Bonnaroo got canceled. Uh, first due to COVID this year due to the floods that came after um, the hurricane uh, that flooded the entire site of Bonnaroo that would make it impassable for vehicles. And you need to be able to get emergency vehicles, not to mention the, the attendees and the performers and the and the vendors. Uh, but you have to be able at a festival. Bonnaroo does have an excellent medical tent. They did. They have addressed some of the problems of the historic festivals uh, and have at least made it a safer, a safer experience for people who are paying incredible money. You know, so I, I did get injured once at Bonnaroo did go to the medical tent uh, I was taken well care of. So um, so I I want the movie version of Woodstock to be true. I want the idyllic version of the hippie movement to be true. But you know you have uh, uh, you have Charles Manson. Uh, you have uh, those murders. You have uh, all kinds of bad things that happen because of the abuse of, of drugs. So it's not, it's not an all, there's violence and drugs and it's not all good. It's not all happy. It's not all peace and love and, uh, you know, tie dye t-shirts as much as I love those three things. Um, so uh, I finally decided uh, to take a, a kind of a, an a academic study of, uh, of Altamont. And I read a book by a cat by the name of Joel Sel Selvin called uh, The Rolling Stones, Hells, Angels, and the In -Store, Inside Story of Rocks. Uh, deepest day. Selvin really digs past the assumptions and generalizations as he unpacks in chilling detail and analysis the total horror of the day. So about four years ago, I, I did a, a kind of a rock and roll summer class that I gave myself um, in nonfiction. And, and this was one of the books that I read. Um, I found that Selvin's searching and sobering book was so compelling uh, that I could not put it down. Um, I inhaled it. It was a page turning like it was a page turning novel. Um, and I reread it again uh, a year later. Um, I love this book. I think I'm going to teach it actually next semester. We'll go even more depth in my uh, America as a mixtape class next semester. Please send your friends uh, 10 a.m. I've got one section of American Lit next semester, 10 a.m. Um, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Please send your uh, your friends this way. Um, so um, all music festivals can be silly and reckless. Uh, uh, they can be uh, decadent uh, celebrations. Um, um, they can be an unnecessary potlatch. That's a Native American term where you're just, you know, it's just excess for the sake of excess. But there is this sense of cosmic abundance that comes from it, which is the glorious thing of human joy. And the same would be said, like of a NASCAR car race, of a U United uh, University of Tennessee football game at Neyland Stadium has that that festive uh, aspect. Um, Contemporary festivals generally range from 20,000 to 100,000 people. Altamont had 300,000. And so one of the things I, I learned in, in, in my study of the earlier 70s festivals is they're just too big. Uh, festivals, uh, the smaller festivals um, are better. And, and today when, you, when you're having multiple uh, huge crowds, you have multiple stages and so you can spread them around. Uh, we would never imagine a single stage festival for that many people today. 
Um, and then also they had to move, they kept having to move sites. No one in California wanted to let them have this thing at all. Uh, but the Rolling Stones were insistent and they had their money and their film team behind it. And so they actually had to move it at the last minute. And they literally built the stage in the dark, in the cold on the day before. And the stage, one of the huge errors, errors of, of Altamont was that the stage was built so low. And of course, the idea that a drugged and drunk motorcycle gang would be the best security detail for an event like this turned out to be the most terrible strategy. Um, this was the hippie period. They were outlaws. They didn't want to deal with uh, with police or EMS or any of the local official authorities. And so they were kind of basically told, you know, the cops and the and the uh, the professionals to stay away. Now, today, when you go to a, a, a big festival, you're going to see law enforcement. You're going to see professional medical and like this. And now this for the kids, some of the kids today who are doing things maybe that they shouldn't be doing that maybe makes them a little bit paranoid or they're a little bit anxious. Um, but it also provides a lot of safety for everybody and for your parents, you know, who, who are letting you go, you know, even though you're 20 and you're an adult and you can do what you want, you know, your parents are letting you go. Maybe they even help buy your ticket for Christmas, you know, um, and they're letting you go to this thing. They're, they're reassured that there's some, you know, normalcy there at the festival, but they didn't want any of that at this festival. They didn't want, um, you know, to deal with the police. And so they hired a motorcycle gang uh, to provide security and then fed them uh, in beer. Even today's bouncers who are more like off duty cops or sometimes uh, Tennessee Tech uh, football players, you know, or whatever uh, on summer break will stand between the fans and the performers separate. You know, they built they build a barricade around the stage. If you've been at a big concert, there's a barricade and then inside the barricade, uh, there's security, and then between uh, the security and the security are in a pit, and the stage is elevated, and there's the band. They had, they took none of these uh, precautions. Uh, the stage was low to the ground. There was no barricade, and the only thing between uh, the bands and the uh, crowd was uh, a drunk motorcycle gang. Uh, they did not have significant uh, food vendors uh, or bathrooms, uh, which is unheard of at today's festivals. Um, it, it was very cold that day. Um, you know, Bonnaroo happens in June for a reason, because even at night, during the day, it's un, 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 unfathomably too warm, right? A hundred, so not, never reaches a hundred, but it's 85 a lot of times and 85 in the sun all day long, no matter how much sunblock and how many little, you know, scarves and umbrellas, you know, you can do for, you know, and even how many, all the tents It's pretty hot. Right. But at night it can get down to the high sixties. And after that, you know, it's still pretty breezy. You can actually get cold you know as the dew is for me wake up to an early morning bonnaroo in the low in the low 60s if you're lucky it feels pretty crisp well in uh uh in december in Cal northern california it got very 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 cold um and so um they're drunk they're high they're cold um and there's way too many people and then finally uh the motorcycle uh gang uh the Rolling Stones take the stage. The, the Grateful Dead showed up and they didn't even want to play because the motorcycle gang actually got into a fight with one of the bands and actually hit one of the band members that they were supposed to be uh, 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 protecting. It was it was really a, a, a disaster. Um, uh, but the, the, the culminating cruelty of Altamont was the murder of Meredith Hunter. Um, I think I did bring in a picture of Meredith Hunter. Uh, the culminating cruelty was the murder of Meredith Hunter by Hell's Angels, Alan Passaro. This brutal stabbing is caught on film in Gimme Shelter. Passaro was ultimately acquitted of murder on the basis of self-defense. His case helped because Hunter, um, the man who was murdered, had a gun, and it appears to be drawn when the angels attack him. All this while the stones played under my thumb. Not sympathy for the devil, as some legends have it. Hunter was an 18-year-old black youth born to African-American mother and a Native American father. He was attending a concert with his white girlfriend, who, and he was wearing a bold green lime suit and hat, hiding his afro. Um, after his death, he was buried in an unmarked grave. His white killer went free. Today, in the shocking period of unchecked white violence against black youth, Meredith Hunter, Mer Meredith Hunter murder should speak to us in new ways. And so I encourage people uh, to take a look at all of the, the story behind this. Um, the Stones are a British band that would be nothing were it not for their inspiration from an appropriation of American black musical forms. Selvin's book also documents that the Stones take a huge gate at their shows, but pay their black supporting artists such as Ike and Tina Turner a mere pittance. Uh, Selvin uh, 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 shows uh, journalist Ralph Gleason taking Mick and company to task uh, as an implied uh, racial or economic imperialism. When I 
when I first saw the Stones as a teenager in Cleveland, Etta James opened the, sh the show. I got to see the Rolling Stones in 81 on the Tattoo Tour as a, as a middle school student. Um, so is there a kind of a, a, a traditional kind of colonial or imperial exploitation happening uh, between the Rolling Stones, British artists, and the American culture and the American Black culture that they their music is so, uh, so inspired from? Um, and then there's just the whole kind of nihilism and hedonism aspects of the hippie movement, which goes in contrast with the peace and love, you know, and the war in Vietnam, you know, recycle, take care of Mother Earth. Um, and a movie critic, Pauline Kael, said about the Give Me Shelter film, she said, Mick Jagger symbolizes the rejection of the values that he appeals to, asking stoned and freaked out people to control themselves is pathetic. And since the most dangerous violence is obviously from the Hells Angels, who are trying to keep their idea of order by stomping dazed, bewildered kids, Jagger saying, brothers and sisters, why are we fighting is pitiful beside the point. Musically, Jagger has no way to cool it because his orgiastic kind of music has only one way to go, higher, until everyone is knocked out. Mick Jagger's performing style is a form of aggression, uh, not just against the straight world, but against his own youth audience. And this appeals to them because it proves to them that he hasn't sold out or gone soft. But when all this aggression is released, who can handle it? Others have tried to show that Altamont is a kind of cosmic failure of the counterculture values, uh, much like uh, Charles Manson. So any culture can become a, uh, a, a, a toxic culture, even a utopian uh, uh, rock culture. Um, the Males' film is brutal. It was, it's, paid for and produced as far as I understand by the Rolling Stones. I don't think the film ever should have been made, but it's a document and it's a, and it's a self, it's a self indictment of, uh, of rock and roll of the dark side of the hippie movement. And it's definitely an indictment of the, of the Rolling Stones. I thought this was bad. And then I watched the Woodstock 99 documentary, which just came out on HBO max this year. And I must tell you Woodstock 99 is worse in some ways than Altamont, like epically and catastrophic worse and what we have is kind of agro metal um, fused with hip-hop uh, that got very popular in the late 1990s and I don't even fully understand uh, this genre of, uh, of metal but this uh, if there was toxic masculinity uh, the seed of toxic masculinity at Altamont toxic ma masculinity is writ large in Woodstock 99 it is not a uh, easy film to watch I don't uh, I can't even necessarily recommend the Woodstock uh, uh, doc 99 documentary simply for the fact of how hard it is to watch and how horrible uh, the behavior of the fan community is at Woodstock 99 and how oblivious uh, Michael Lang, who helped stage Woodstock 69 is. And I say Michael Lang is kind of clueless. He seemed clueless. If you watch the 69 documentary, he seems kind of clueless. And I think he just got lucky. And I believe he's, he's somehow corporately tied to the insignia and they make so much money just off of the, the t-shirts and uh, the branding of that, uh, you know, the guitar and all that three days of peace and music that they make so much of that branding that I think Michael Lang has lived his entire life without having to work a, a real, a, a real job uh, because he lives off of that, uh, off of that Woodstock brand. Um, but the legacy of, of, of Altamont uh, lives on in Woodstock 99. And it's, it's terrifying. And if you watch that, you know, don't show your parents. If you're thinking about asking for Bonnaroo 2022 tickets uh, for Christmas, don't let your parents watch Woodstock 99. They'll, they won't let you, They'll, they'll they'll come and blockade your driveway uh, and tell you don't go, don't go, don't go. Um, Bonnaroo is a uh, is problematic as all of these are, but I think it is a beautiful uh, thing. It, it it brings a lot of business to rural Tennessee. The community of Manchester is is, is benefited wildly and greatly uh, from uh, the community experience of Bonnaroo. And I have a testimony. Uh, I've already talked about this a little bit on the show about my struggles with uh, with addiction, uh, but I found uh, the Soberu community at, at Bonnaroo, the Yellow Boone community, and I and I today I'm an active member of Yellow Boone communities, which are communities of music fans who choose to remain drug and alcohol free at concerts, and it's an amazing, enriching experience, and it's kind of like rehab on the road, and you are doing service also because you're there for somebody, who, a fan, a music fan who might eventually you know, get what you want and, and or uh, want what you you've got, I should say. Now, let me just keep this in perspective. Now, these are these these are decadent, wasteful things. No one needs to go to one of these things. 
but whether or not I go or don't go, they're going to they're going to go on. And so I try to bring um, some of my values of recovery. And then also uh, at, at Bonnaroo, I have participated in Planet Roo, uh, where they have tried to, you know, bring some values of ecology and community and uh, social justice uh, to the fan community um, at, at Bonnaroo. It's been a few years since I've been to the farm in Manchester, but I, I might go back. I've been many, many times. It's been a very positive part of my life uh, for several years. Uh, some tech colleagues and I did some workshops. We actually worked at the festival and, and brought workshops there as well. Um, but it was really a meaningful experience to me, um, newly sober in uh, 2009, to find the Yellow Balloon community, which I've been a part of ever since, uh, which meets at, at uh, concerts all over the, the, the globe, especially all over the continental United States. And uh, following several large bands, especially in the in the jam band community to provide traction in an otherwise uh, slippery environment. Um, thanks for coming to my TED Talk on, uh, on music festivals today. Please stay on the call for just a moment. I will see if I can uh, figure out how uh, to stop recording uh, right now. Thank you, guys.